Blessed are those who mourn. That's our message this morning from Matthew 5, verse 4. This is week three of our new series, Sitting at the Feet of Jesus. Again, I'm just excited about what this message can bring to me, to you, to all of us. And so we're going to take our time to go through this incredible block of, of kingdom teaching. I'm not going to rush through it because Jesus intended for all who call themselves his disciples to grapple with and learn to live out these principles in our daily lives. As we talked about last week, it's not always so simple to understand this. So we need to unpack it. We can't, we can't live something out until we grasp what it is we're being asked to do. So this week, again, we're going to be looking at verse 4 of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. It reads as follows. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed, fortunate, highly favored are those who mourn. So that's another surprising declaration, don't you think? Up to this past year, so I would have said that I had very little personal experience with mourning. I lost my dad some 25 years ago, but our relationship was kind of broken and estranged. And while I was there at his bedside and, and we made peace with all the stuff in the past, um, I never felt any real significant loss when he passed away. In many ways, I had already grieved this loss many years earlier when I went through a process of self-discovery and truth-telling concerning my childhood and young adult years. And I came to realize that, that what I had grieved, and I had grieved already, was the loss uh, of my mostly fatherless upbringing. So that's where the grief was. And, and this points to, I think, another type of grief that, and mourning that we might not at first recognize in ourselves, but many of us have experienced grief and mourning over the course of our entire lives that has not been associated with death or dying. Truth be told, many of us carry these wounds of, of, of life's griefs and mourning many years beyond the events that precipitated them. So in one way or another, these things are often still with us and often responsible for coloring our personalities and even distorting how we view life. The Bible is filled, by the way, with accounts of this type of hardship and grief. The Bible, as you know, is real, it's gritty, it's down to earth. When it comes to these things, it contains many accounts that detail some of the most horrific things that people are capable of doing to one another, including what they did to Jesus. Many people, they make an error when they, when they read the Bible because they come to it with this idea that if it's in the Bible, then God must be okay with it. And nothing can be further from the truth. What they miss is the Bible is the historic account of God's faithfulness amidst humanity's faithlessness and sin and rebellion. That's what the story of the Bible is about. And especially in Jesus, we see God making a heroic effort to save us by Him dealing with our sin, the sin that we couldn't and sometimes wouldn't deal with at His own expense. Grief and sorrow were never part of God's original plan. Sadly, they are consequences of a world gone rogue. Not that God didn't know that, and not that God didn't create the world knowing that, but the original plan, and the plan we will someday return in the future with, will exclude uh, sorrow and mourning and all that. Now, when I was a younger lad living on the North Shore of Boston, I had this friend whose older brother was killed suddenly in an automobile accident. He had gone on a weekend hunting trip with his dad, and he never returned. It was the first time someone I knew died, and I, I remember it left me confused. I, I didn't really know what to do with that. I'd never experienced that. Up to that point, I'd been hanging over my friend's house regularly. I had even begun to sleep over there, and, and, but all that came to like a stop after the loss of his brother. It changed the, the dynamics in the home. I never asked about the accident, um, all I recall was that his dad had been driving, and I, I was thinking, what a grief he must have bore in that. The loss seemed to change everything, and after his brother's death, my friend stopped inviting me over, and soon he and his family, they moved away, and I, I never seen them again. Working on this week's message, I was reminded of this childhood friend, and so I googled 
his name only to find that he died back in 2008 at age 51. And he was survived by his mom, who now bore the loss of the last of her two boys. Life can be hard sometimes. It can even seem cruel. And as most of you know, over the past 10 months or so, our family, we've had more than our share of this stuff. So have many of you. I know a number of you have, have lost your husbands, and you're bearing this grief as you, as you try to move on somehow. So quite frankly, it seems like there's little in this type of grief and mourning that could be considered a blessing, really. Rather, it seems part and parcel of the brokenness of our world, doesn't it? And yet here in the second beatitude, Jesus refers to mourning as a blessing. How can that be? How can that be? Obviously, taken on the surface, it doesn't make sense. It's difficult to answer this question. And so we're going to have to dive in deeper. We're going to have to look deeper to find the meaning that Jesus intended. But before we move on to that, I think it's worth taking a few moments to talk about grief. The word in the Greek that Jesus uses here is the strongest Greek word that can possibly be used in the context of grieving. For instance, it was the word used in the Old Testament Old Testament Septuagint to describe the grief of Jacob as he mourned over his son Joseph, whom he believed killed by wild animals. So Jesus no doubt wanted to bring to our minds at least an image of this type of sadness and grief. The word was almost always used in the context of grief and mourning over a loved one. Isaiah tells us that Jesus was a man familiar with sorrow and grief. We see this play out in, in a number of passages that tell us something about how Jesus responds to grief and death as he walks the earth. At the grave of Lazarus, for instance, we're told Jesus not only wept, but he was troubled in his spirit and moved deeply. The word that they use in the Greek is it's kind of hard for us to flesh out, but it's, it's really like a ball of emotion. It hit him in the pit of his stomach, if we could say it that way. He was deeply moved over what happened. Despite, and this is interesting, despite that he knew in advance what he actually came there to do. He knew, the, he knew what he came there to do. And when Mary came out to meet Jesus, you know, Mary, the one that sat at Jesus' feet, and he saw her grief and sadness, he was so deeply moved in his spirit that he, that he wept openly. And the Pharisees and the Jews around him, they said, see how he loved that man. How come he couldn't be here to save him? He could, he could heal others. He could save others. Why couldn't he be here to save Lazarus? When there's grief in mourning, there's questions like that. What if and how come? The same word is used a second time when Jesus approaches the grave. The word can be used to express strong emotion and even indignation which has led some to suggest that Jesus was actually angry when he approached Lazarus' tomb over the unnatural presence of death in God's creation, in his creation. The unnatural presence of death that caused his dear friends such sadness and such grief. As with most Greek words, context often determines how the word is to be understood and, and deeply moved is a reasonable, it's a good translation. And yet at some level, I think there's there's, there's, there's also something underneath. Jesus may also have felt anger and indignation over how sin and death had corrupted his creation. There's no reason the two things can't be there at the same time. Isn't that how, how our emotions work? We're not like one, one size fits all. Sometimes we feel different things, even conflicting things at the same time. We see him deeply moved again over the death of the widow's son in the town of Nain in Luke 7. Luke tells us that when Jesus saw this woman, there was, just, uh, there was a, a, a procession coming out to the, to the, to the grave, um, and Jesus happened to be in the town, by the, by the Spirit, happened to be in the town as they passed by. And, and it tells us that when Jesus saw the woman grieving for her son, his heart went out to her. It's an interesting phrase. His heart went out to her. 
She had already lost her husband and now her only son. And, and Luke tells us at that moment, his heart met hers. And her grief was more than Jesus was willing for her to bear. Now this is interesting. Unlike other miracles, there was no expectation of faith from this grieving mom. It's likely that in her sorrow, this woman never even knew Jesus was there in the crowd until he stepped forward and raised her son. Judging by the reaction of the crowds, Jesus was, was yet an unknown person to them. So this miracle is unique in that there was no expectation of faith from the grieving mom. And yet Jesus raised her son anyway. It was purely an act of passion and compassion for this woman that moved Jesus to action. Either way, it's, an incredi it's incredible when you think about it. So for those of us who struggled with the loss of a loved one, and, and I, I want you to feel the heart of Jesus' compassion for this woman, because he feels the same for you and I. And these two events, they, they, I think they provide sort of a snapshot into the heart of Jesus and how he experienced grief and mourning while he walked upon the earth. They show us at least one side of what Isaiah revealed about Jesus, telling us directly that Jesus would be a man of sorrows, that he would be acquainted with and familiar with grief. Not as one detached and peering at it from a distance, no, but as one deeply familiar with it, one who, ex who ex experienced it directly. Why, why is this important? Well, in his book on, on grief, Bob Kellerman quotes an unnamed source when he writes the following, shared sorrow is endurable sorrow. Think about that for a minute. Shared sorrow is endurable sorrow. Now, in Jesus, there's much more to it than just his sharing our sorrows. For Jesus came to destroy death and destroy the devil who uses it to keep humanity in bondage to him. So there's much more here. But if there's any blessing in our sadness and grief to be found, whether it's the loss of a loved one or the baggage of life's multiple griefs that we, and sorrows that we all carry, knowing Jesus is moved in his spirit, deeply troubled in his spirit over our pain, knowing that his heart goes out to us when we grieve, knowing that he has himself shared so deeply and so willingly in humanity's sorrow that he would suffer such a death to save us. That's like shared sorrow on steroids, right? In Jesus, we can find healing and strength that makes bearing our heartaches possible. Again, shared sorrow is endurable sorrow, especially when we share it with the Lord Jesus. In this case, however, the blessing is not found in the grief and the loss itself. The death of, of a loved one is not the blessing Jesus refers to here. Yet knowing Jesus has experienced grief also and walks along with us through, through ours makes our grief bearable, doesn't it? Makes anything bearable. That in itself is a great comfort and it should never be overlooked. And there's a blessing in looking forward someday to the age to come, isn't there? When death and dying, sickness and mourning and pain and everything associated with, with these things in our life is wiped away and will be replaced with the presence of God and His unimaginable joy and peace. There's also a Romans 8.28 blessing to be had even in the midst of our grief and mourning. For as Paul tells us, all things work for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. But all things are not good. We know that. That's not true. Some are, in fact, meant for harm and even evil. But if we give them over to God and we trust him with the outcome, the blessing of Romans 8.28 kicks in and, and God gets an opportunity to use whatever situation we find ourselves in, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult, for our benefit, for our good. 
Joseph was a perfect example of this principle in action. His brothers sold him into slavery. Potiphar's wife uh, tried to have him sexually and then when he refused, made false accusations against him and had her husband throw him in prison. Imagine this young man's sadness and grief. So great was the hatred of his own brothers towards him that they sold him into slavery. They wanted to kill him. And then they told their father that he was dead and laid that kind of mourning and grief upon him. Joseph was dragged from his homeland by force, enslaved in a foreign land, and now in prison for a crime he didn't commit. I think most of us would agree that Joseph, Joseph had a right to grieve, and he did before the Lord. Yet he, endured, he also endured in faith, and he continued to trust God with these circumstances that made no sense to him, and eventually God rewarded him. He have elevated him to the highest office in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. Now, most of us are not going to be vice president, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but think about the principle of this. And when he recognized his brothers standing in the Egyptian food line, right, he didn't seek revenge. He certainly could have had them all killed, but he didn't. But rather, he forgave them, saying, what you meant for evil, God meant for good and for the saving of many lives. So the blessing and mourning can also be found in the way hardship moves us towards God. Sadly, for many, it, it does the opposite. It pushes them away. They, they blame God for their circumstances and they, they, just, they just can't deal with it. And I'm not putting anybody down. It's just, it's just the opposite of the of, of the positive and the blessing. Because for those who can, who can bring this greatest of their pain to God, He not only bears it with us, but He draws us closer through it. As Robert Browning Hamilton wrote in his poem entitled, Along the Road, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. A lot of wisdom in that. And so we grieve and we learn, and all the while we draw closer to God in our grief and in our spiritual poverty. And through it all, we experience greater dependence and trust in God. And in, and in this way, there's a blessing that comes with even the bitterest of life's griefs and sorrows but only if we grieve in Jesus and we allow God to be our comforter in the midst of it. It is God's will and delight to comfort his children when the tragedies of life come knocking at our doors. Yet the comfort in the loss of a loved one is really not at the heart of what Jesus is driving at here. As important and as dear to us as all of that is, and that's why I shared it, because it's important and it's meaningful and we need to know these things and we need to, to feel these things in our heart. Jesus wants to take us even deeper into God's blessing. A blessing that can only be found as we begin to conform to the image of Christ in us through the Holy Spirit. See, all the Beatitudes they're declarations of blessing that we, we need to work towards. There's, there's something required of us. Conforming to the image of Christ, as Romans 8.29 mentions, takes huge effort. But as Dallas Willard points out, grace is, is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. God isn't opposed to our, our efforts at conforming to his will, our efforts to want to live and be like Jesus. He's opposed to our attempts at earning his blessing and favor somehow through these works. That's the cart before the horse. That's backwards. So as we consider the context of the Sermon on the Mount, and we realize that righteousness, God's righteousness, is at the core of all that Jesus will teach, we begin to realize the mourning Jesus refers to goes beyond the hurtful events of our lives, beyond our own grief over loved ones even. 
So what then is Jesus actually driving at? He's using this language of grief and mourning to get our attention. He's using it to point us towards the deeper spiritual principle of repentance. That's what Jesus is talking about. For in the end, uh, it is the brokenness of our sin in this world that has opened the door to death and mourning in the first place. So let's try to understand this beatitude this way. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin and brokenness and the sin that is caused, that caused in our lives in our, and in our world. I didn't say that right. Let me, let me do that again. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin and the brokenness sin has caused in our lives and in our world. Okay? Jesus declares that those who mourn over grieving God's heart are the ones who will experience God's blessing and comfort. Those who, who grasp their true spiritual poverty and mourn over their sin to the point of repentance are those who receive the blessing and the benefit that God offers. Do you recall what John the Baptist's message was? Anybody remember? What, what was John going around saying? Anybody remember? Repent, right? For the kingdom of God is, is near, right? And when after John was in prison, guess what Jesus' message was? It was the same. Jesus began to preach and teach the same. Everywhere he went, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. So the Sermon on the Mount is not like a different message. It's not like Jesus had this little, like, I don't know, uh, foundational message, and then he moved it way up here to this, this other, you know, higher level. That's not it. It's, he has this, it's not a different message. It's simply an extension of what it means to repent and live for God and not for ourselves. That's why the Sermon on the Mount is so important. 2 Corinthians 7.10 affirms this principle, telling us that, that, that only godly sorrow leads to repentance and salvation. There is a worldly grief and worldly sorrow. That's humanity's lot. That's true, there is. But grieving without promise and mourning without hope in Christ doesn't bring the blessing of God. Only grief and repentance over our sins can do that. And while Jesus may be using hyperbole, the point he is making is actually crystal clear, namely that our sin should grieve us as deeply as the loss of a loved one. There's, if, if we're allowing sin to just be, oh, no big deal, we don't understand this. And we need personally to dig deeper. Because it is grief over our sin that leads to repentance and salvation. And in this very real grieving of our hearts before God is found the favor and blessing of this particular beatitude. As David will write, writes in Psalm 51, 17, a broken and contrite heart God will never despise. He's never going to turn away a repentant heart. Never. Now, unlike our first century contemporaries, we know the end of the story has been written. These folks on, the, on that mountain that day, they're just meeting Jesus maybe for the first time, following him for a little while. They don't really know where this whole thing is going. They don't have a clue how this thing is going to end. But we do, because we're this side of the whole thing, and, and we, we know, right? We know the end of the story has been written. We know the cross is coming and, and we know why. And it should cause us to grieve all the more then over our sin because we understand not only our culpability, but the great cost of our sin upon Jesus. We know the grief of our sin has caused the Holy Spirit. We know the grief our sin has caused in the heart of our Father. So with that in mind, we might better understand the second beatitude this way. Blessed are those that grieve deeply over their sin and over the wickedness of this world and the role they have allowed sin to play in their lives. In the sorrow of repentance, they will find their ultimate comfort. We would do well to think of the beatitudes kind of as a spiritual ladder that help us climb up towards Christ, towards the image of Jesus. 
I know these are not familiar structures in most of the neighborhoods around here, but if we envisioned our spiritual journey as a, a metal fire escape, right? The Beatitudes would be the ladder that needs to be lowered to the street level so that we can get up to the first floor level. So from there that we could gain access to the rest of the stairs and go to the higher floors. But first, we have to have the ladder brought down and we need to climb up the ladder to the first level. Charles Spurgeon had a practical saying concerning this. He would say, a ladder, in order to be of any use, has to have its first rung close to the ground. And of course, what Spurgeon had in mind was the rung must be low enough in order to be useful to us. If Jesus had started with, blessed are the peacemakers or blessed are the pure of heart, and he didn't say anything else, the bar would be way too high for most of us. We would struggle to get up at all. But in his gentle, his kind, and his loving way, Jesus invites us to take the first step towards righteousness in him. The first step towards true spiritual maturity, wisdom, and righteousness. The first step towards becoming like him. And in him, and him only, lies the possibility of our reaching anything like pure of heart or peacemaker. We don't have that in ourselves. What if Jesus had started with Matthew 5.20? For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What if he told the people of his day that if you have any chance of making it here into the kingdom, your righteousness has to be greater than the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He did that, but if he had not given them these steps beforehand, he would have crushed their hopes. The people of that day, they looked to the Pharisees and the teaching of the law to understand God's word and his requirements for holiness. They didn't yet understand what Jesus was bringing or how different that his teaching actually was. To them, the Pharisees and the teaching of the law, they were examples of how God wanted people to live. So Jesus builds a ladder to help them understand that righteousness before God has to be more than religious duty and more than just a keeping of rigid requirements of the law. And the ladder has an order. You can't jump to the top down here. It starts at the bottom. It begins on the bottom rung. One cannot begin to climb without the admission of poverty of spirit. Otherwise, we still think we have something to give. We have something to offer. We can tell God kind of how to manage things. Don't we do that a lot? We like to, we pray, we like to tell God, give him a little advice on how kind of, you know, our situation ought to come out. Don't we do that? True poverty of spirit realizes we don't have anything to say in that, that conversation. And now the second rung, repentance and mourning over a sin-filled life. One cannot go on until these first two steps have been climbed. Have to admit our powerlessness, our brokenness, our spiritual poverty. We have to admit that we're sinners and that it grieves God's heart and it should grieve ours. So weep and wail over your sins with a depth of sorrow um, you would express over the loss of a loved one. That's essentially what Jesus is saying here. So let me ask an obvious question. When was the last time you wept over your sinful state? When was the last time you were grieved by something you said or did or thought, knowing, knowing that it grieved God's heart? This is the place where mourning itself becomes a blessing. Mourning over sin is likely the best evidence, by the way, that we have for true repentance and salvation. If you find yourself from time to time wondering, am I really saved? Am I really saved? The struggle with your sinful humanity, or if you struggle with your sinful humanity, it's good evidence of your salvation and of the Holy Spirit working in your heart. Unsaved people don't struggle with their sin. They simply excuse it or pay no attention to it at all. Sometimes we go through times when God is silent, don't we? Because we've been wrapped up in the distractions of life. It's not a good thing, but we all know that it happens. It's not an excuse. But when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes, 
Do you evidence salvation by repenting and returning to what you know is God's best for you? I imagine that most of you sitting here can say amen to that. Yes, I do. Now, at times, God will allow us to go through tough situations to get us there, to get us deeper so we can uh, receive this blessing all the more. Like we talked about last week, things in the world will offend us. God's word will offend us. A brother or sister may have a hard word for us, but if we're in the spirit, we'll not only hear it with spiritual ears, we'll repent and turn again to the path that Jesus has set us upon. Godly mourning over sin assures us of the blessing of salvation because it is only through the Holy Spirit that we're ever convicted of sin and grieve it in the first place. If God wasn't in us, we, we wouldn't have these emotions and, and, and griefs over our sins. People that are carnal and unsaved, they don't mourn over their sin. They may be well the consequences or the trouble that it got them in, but they don't mourn over grieving God's heart. Don't mourn over grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, did you ever notice, the longer we're in Christ, the more hidden our sins become. Did you ever notice that? They seem to go underground, don't they? They get underground. They get hidden. When we first came to Christ, most of us were a mess, right? We begin to change uh, our obvious failings that everyone knew about anyway, that everyone could see, but as the years go by, our sins, they tend to go underground. We've cleaned up the outer stuff, but the rest is still there. We work hard not to let them show on the surface, don't we? Not always because we're being godly, but because we care what others think about us, right? Isn't that true? Lots of times that's the motivation. But eventually, whether we like it or not, if you're in Christ and you, and you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, God's going to deal with those hidden things. That's exactly what Hebrews 4.12 refers to when it speaks of God's Word, penetrating and dividing. The sword of the Word, dividing soul and spirit, bone and marrow, helping us judge righteously concerning our thoughts and, and the motivations of our hearts. That's the stuff that, gets, that tries to hide underneath. This is where God begins to, to deal with the, with the things that no one sees and the things that sometimes we're not even aware of until the Holy Spirit reveals them and brings them to the surface and then brings conviction in our life. Can anyone say amen to that? Is that, is that your experience too? So this is how God begins to surgically remove our hidden sin. The truth is, the longer we're in Christ, the more corrupt we realize that we are. I don't know about you, but I always thought, by this time I thought I would be better. I thought I'd be further along. And, and just when I get this down, I, I see God exposes something else. It's like, oh my goodness, that's even worse. <laughs> and it's a good thing when it grieves us, by the way. It's a good thing. It means that we're alive. We're spiritually alive. The world would look at us from the outside and wonder, what is your problem? What's the big deal, right? They don't get it at all. But we know what the big deal is, don't we? Because there are no little sins. There's only division and separation from God. There's, there are no little sins. There's only spiritual death. And it's a good thing when our sins grieve us because we know willful sin grieves God's heart. And it shows us that we're spiritually alive, blessed, fortunate, and highly favored. That's why we can say that, are those who mourn over their sinful state. For they demonstrate they have a sensitivity to sin. God has given them a sensitivity to sin. God has given us the sensitivity. Blessed are those who mourn over their weaknesses and their failure to conform to anything close to the image of Christ. For in that, you'll be comforted. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but in, in this surrender, in this admission, in the things that we're trying to hide from, if we expose them, we'll actually find comfort and joy. Short of glory, how will we be comforted, you might ask? 
Well, we'll be comforted on the day we realize we no longer need to be humble daily before God. Like maybe it's every other day or once a week. You know, that would be good. When we sense the Lord's comfort when we realize certain ugly thoughts and motives in us aren't there anymore. They've kind of been laid to rest. We'll realize the Lord's comfort on the day we get a glimpse of what it means to be a peacemaker in a situation instead of bringing extra chaos into the deal. When we find ourselves seeking purity of heart and motive rather than always looking out for ourselves. We'll be comforted on the day when God gives us an opportunity to mentor a younger believer. When we realize that we used to be like him or her, but we're not any longer. We'll find God's comfort through the inner peace of Christ we receive when we finally surrender at this deeper level and no longer find ourselves fighting with God about the little things, you know, trying to, trying to say, well, can I at least do that? You know what I mean? When all that stuff goes away and we find ourselves walking in step with Christ in the Spirit. These are the blessings that repentance and mourning over our sins can bring. In the end, the comfort for those of us who mourn over our sins is the Spirit of Jesus living in us. The Spirit of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, including yours and mine, living in us. We are blessed, as the hymn writer penned, when I think that God is son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on a cross, my burden, gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Such comforting words and thoughts, aren't they? And that I might grieve my sinful state to a point of becoming willing to put to death for God's glory uh, the sinful things of my life. This is the blessing come to fruition, that in him we are more than conquerors, as Paul writes in Romans. All has been accomplished. It is, as Jesus uttered in his last words on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. The work has been completed. It's our job to enter into it and learn how to receive it. And because of this grief, I can grasp what Paul meant when he wrote in Galatians 2.20, I live by faith for and in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How can we not be comforted by these words? How can we not be assured by these words? Come to me, Jesus says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and I will give you rest. I'll give you comfort for your soul. Blessed and highly favored are those who mourn, for they will have God himself as their comforter. Amen? Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for these uh, wonderful words. At first they make us wonder, what are you, what are you saying? What do you mean? And then we discover their depth. And that you, as always, have our best in mind. So we just thank you and praise you, Lord. We lift you up in this place. And I pray particularly for the congregation now, that, 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 and myself as well, as we go through this uh, sermon that you, you gave on this, this mount some 2,000 years ago. Through the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring it to life in our hearts and our minds so that we would not only understand it, but that we would receive it in the depths of our soul. Jesus, that we would actually come to you, our teacher, our rabbi, and you would show us what the mind and the heart of God is toward these things. I pray that we wouldn't resist it, that we wouldn't defend ourselves before you, but we would accept the verdict of powerlessness and uh, spiritual poverty, and that we don't really have a lot to offer in this, so that our eyes and our ears can be opened and our mouth may be shut, so that we can hear what it is you're teaching us. Lord, and I pray over all of us today, the griefs and the sorrows um, 
and the difficulties of life and the scars that they have left. Lord, I put all that before you. Jesus, the great healer, we, we, we just surrender these things to you. Um, they've colored our personality. They've changed our attitudes. They've, um, they've caused us to be, um, to not risk loving sometimes. Lord, I give all that to you and just ask that you would receive it as our offering as we begin these couple steps up this ladder to where it is you're taking us and taking this church. Lord, we also lift our church up to you. Um, We can't change things. We can't bring people here. We can't transform hearts. Only you can do that. And so we put this before you. um, And we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.